Great woo wee hop. Okay, I just got like <laughs> a weird noise saying it was going to be recorded. Okay. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so we are the Diogene Lab, which, which stands for Dynamics and Organization of Genomes. We are situated in the middle of Paris. And we are mostly a comparative genomics group. We are a multi-PI group. So I'm working uh, with other senior and junior PIs, especially Hugo Rouskrolius. Um, and the project I'm going to speak about today, um, sorry, it's going too well. Yes, um, is about fish. So I know we have quite a lot of fish fans in the assembly today. So um, today we're going to talk about fish and their whole genome duplications. Uh, we're interested in fish first because they are one of the most diverse groups of vertebrates in terms of number of species. Um, they are the most diverse group of vertebrates. There's an extreme diversity in fish in terms of body sizes, also coloration, um, body organization, as you can see with the morries, which are like long and thin and some that are like nice and thick and chunky and some that are flat. Lots of different phenotypes and adaptation to different eco ecological niches uh, in fish, which make them a great group to study uh, evolutionary and ecological genomics. And in fact, fish have been used as model organisms for a very long time for all kinds of applications through genomic and biological research. Um, of course, there's the zebrafish, which is kind of the flagship fish um, in terms of model organisms. Uh, zebrafish have been used for developmental biology, neurosciences, uh, and the modeling of human disorders for many, many years. They are very tractable, easily raised in the lab uh, model animal that reproduces most of the big features um, of vertebrate uh, development and which make them very tractable models in the lab. But there's also plenty of different fish that have been used as organisms, as model organisms for different questions. For example, the killifish is becoming one of the uh, very preeminent models to study aging and lifespan. And of course, uh, the cichlids have been used for many, many years to understand how uh, evolutionary radiations occur how species adapt to ecological niches, but also questions such as introgression or sexual selection. So research using fish as models um, uh, covers a very large variety of research questions. And that's one of the reasons why understanding fish genomes and providing resources for comparative genomics of fish, especially related to other fish and also to human, uh, is of particular importance for us. And one of the um, main characteristics of fish is that they are in fact ancient polyploids. Um, they have undergone a number of events that we call whole genome duplications, where the entire genome becomes duplicated. That's the case for all vertebrates. Um, early during vertebrate evolution, vertebrates when the vertebrate ancestor went through two foundational events of whole genome duplications that are still partly visible in the human genome today. And fish are fantastic to study whole genome duplications because they have undergone a number of much more recent events um, that are still very visible in fish genomes. And they also have another foundational event just before the clade of fish diversified uh, which is called the 3R duplication, teleost-specific duplication, um, which has been deeply studied. Uh, where is this? Okay. Um, so to zoom in a little bit more on the um, species tree of fish, uh, these, there is the, so this uh, 3R teleost-specific whole genome duplication right here that gave birth to all of these different groups of fish. But we also have a number of events that we also study one that is very preeminent is the duplication event that occurred in the salmonids. So the trout, the salmon, which are fairly recently duplicated genomes where the polyploidy is still very visible. There is also an event in carps, so not in zebrafish, but in a related group. And there is another event right here that is from a sister group to teleosts. So teleosts are all of these fish that have been duplicated very anciently. 
So in this group that contains, uh, for example, the, the sturgeons, the sturgeons have had a more recent duplication event as well that is independent from the event that occurred in teleos fish. So these fish are ancient polyploids and one characteristic of polyploids is that they have a genome structure where these polyploidization events are typically still visible. So what happens when you have a whole genome duplication event is that from pairs of chromosomes that are diploid, you get organisms that actually have full chromosomes for every anciently pair, now tetrad. This is very challenging for, um, for the individuals, especially during meiosis, because then during meiosis, tetravalence established instead of divalence. This is challenging for the individuals to get proper meiosis and the meiosis tends to be unstable. So what tends to happen after a whole genome duplication event is that chromosomes will rearrange. Um, they will fuse in some um, uh, configurations. They will sometimes rearrange by translocations and so on. And we think that this happens because it makes meiosis easier to process um, and it stabilizes meiosis, so it tends to be selected for. So when you look at a tetraploid or anciently polyploid organisms, you will often find traces of this tetraploidization structure, but they're not completely obvious to the eye very often. And it tends to look like this. So this is the genome of the rainbow trout. As I mentioned, the rainbow trout is a salmonid. Salmonid underwent through a whole genome duplication about 100 million years ago. And this is what um, the genome of the trout looks like. So you have 29 chromosomes in trout, which you can see at these gray, gray bars around um, the plot. And each of these chromosomes is a mosaic of regions that each have a sister duplicated region elsewhere in the trout genome. So these chromosomes result from the rearrangements of this anciently tetraploid structure of the ancestral genome of salmonids, which have become rearranged to um, probably stabilize the meiosis. And so the duplication structure is still very apparent, but you no longer have this one-to-one -one pairing of chromosomes that you would expect to see just right after the whole genome duplication event. And that is very typical of ancient polyploids. Now, when we zoom in um, into one of these chromosomes and we look at the gene structure, these duplication events are still like very easy to um, identify because, so if you look at the trout genome in this case, which is duplicated and you compare it to another genome, in this case, the Medaka, which didn't go through this whole genome duplication event 100 million years ago, and you compare the order of the genes, well, the order of the genes tend to be pretty conserved in evolution uh, in vertebrates. So you can see that the order is conserved, but of course, because the trout genome is duplicated, each region in the Medaka corresponds to two different genomes, to two different genomic regions in the trout genome. And you will find that you have genes corresponding as orthologs to each of these genes in Medaka in these two regions of the trout genome. After the whole genome duplication event, you not only have this reorganization and rearrangement of the chromosomes, but you also have what we call the rediploidization, which is that the majority of genes that are now in two copies because the genome was duplicated, not all of these genes are going to be kept in two copies over very long evolutionary times. So some will, and in this case, you will find that for one gene, in this case in Medaka, you have two different genes in trout, which we called homologs. But for the majority of genes, you will have one gene in Medaka and just one gene in trout. And these are going to be kept on one or the other of these duplicated genomic regions. So you get this kind of interleaving pattern of conservation of genes um, compared to an outgroup genome that hasn't been duplicated. All right, so the question we are mostly interested in for this project is to understand how genes evolved after a whole genome duplication event. And the reason for that is that, as I mentioned, um, 
whole genome duplications have been foundational uh, in vertebrates, and we know that they contribute very important genes during these duplications. For example, in the human genome, where we had these two major whole genome duplications event very, very anciently, about 500 million years ago in vertebrates, we still find that some gene clusters have remained in full copies after the two rounds of duplications. And that includes some very important genes, such as the Hox genes, uh, which are, of course, very important for development and the establishment of the body plan, but also clusters of genes that looks like uh, the major histocompatibility complex, which, of course, is very important for the immune system, and a few other clusters of very important genes, such as the Fox genes and genes that are important for development. So it's been understood for a long time that these whole genome duplication events probably provide new gene copies of genes that are important and that these gene copies can evolve to new functions and can promote the evolution of species. And understanding how genes evolve after a whole duplication event has been a long-standing question in evolutionary biology. It's been reported in a number of articles that this polyploidization event probably drive rapid adaptation because they provide all of these new important um, freshly duplicated gene copies that evolution can act on. It's been proposed that fish are so diverse because they have this whole genome duplication event that gave them the possibility to evolve into all kinds of different phenotypes and function. Um, there's a lot of information related to how gene expression changes after whole after a whole genome duplication, because you have two copies of every gene that was present in the ancestor, it's thought that one of the gene copies can change in function or in regulation, that it becomes expressed, for example, in different tissues, or the two gene copies can partition the different functions of the ancestral gene to become more specialized. It's been proposed that these gene copies coming from the whole genome duplication events tend to associate with disease. Uh, some of them because they are important for development and for um, the um, immune system and so on, so that some might be implied in important processes where the two copies are kept because a redundant copy is interesting for the organisms and after a while they become fixed and losing these copies um, is associated with disease but also because some gene copies after a whole genome duplication may be difficult to lose. That is the case for oncogenes, for example. Oncogenes are genes where when they acquire mutation, this mutation is often to dominant negative and um, they can process to cancer. So losing these genes once they have become duplicated might be difficult for these organisms. So they remain in two copy and they provide a burden uh, to the organism. And there's quite a lot of debate on how genome duplications come into place in the first place. Do they come? We know that they can happen through two different mechanisms, either a, me a meiosis that goes wrong and you have two copies of the parental genome, or because of the fecundation of um, gametes from two different organisms, that then the meiosis is, in is unstable and then you become uh, a tetraploid. So because we are interested in how these genes evolve, especially when they are kept in two copies or when you have different copies that are kept in different organisms, a question of interest for us is to reconstruct the histories of the genes after the whole genome duplication. So how do we classically reconstruct gene histories? Well, gene histories typically are reconstructed using the sequences of the genes under a fairly um, a fairly classical process to which we assume that gene copies that are very similar must have diverged recently. So we will compare the sequences of these different genes and try to find which ones are closest in terms of sequence and we will assume that these have diverged only recently. So we can build trees of these genes based on their sequence and the similarity of their sequences which we call gene tree that reflects how closely related these sequences are. And then we would compare the structure of this gene tree to the structure of the species relationship. 
because of course um, the structure that we might obtain here is not always exactly congruent with the structure of the species tree. And that gives us some information on, for example, if some gene copies um, have been duplicated, if some have been lost and so on. And that allows us to obtain what we call a reconciled gene tree, where we can place events of gene duplications and gene losses. All right, so this process has been around for a very long time. That's how typically we obtain um, the histories of the genes. A problem here is that we know that this process is not error free and errors tend to occur more frequently uh, in a number of cases, especially when you have many gene copies per species, because of course then the potential for error becomes larger. When you have a fast species radiation, because then your signal at the moment when all the different species um, radiate is pretty low to resolve exactly the relationship between these different species. And generally when you have low evolutionary signal, and this can occur in a different number of cases, especially when your species are closely related and the speciation is recent, because then the sequences haven't had time to accumulate a sufficient number of mutations to resolve the different relationships. Or when the event is very, when the, um, the speciations are very ancient, because in this case, you have so many mutations that it's difficult to make sense of, um, of the signal. Of course, a problem that we have when we study whole genome duplications is that we tend to have a compounding of all these different errors occurring in the trees because the duplication generates many copies across the different species. We tend to have quite fast radiation of species after the whole genome duplication, a lot of diversity. And the um, evolutionary signal tends to come from an um, ancient event, so it's often not very well resolved. And the reason why we get all of these errors when we look at gene histories during whole genome duplications is that because of this low signal, when we have an alignment of sequences for a gene, there's typically not one tree um, that comes out and that is very, very superior to the other trees that we could build. Typically what we obtain is what we call the forest of trees. So a number of different trees that could accommodate the information that we find from the sequences. And we will typically pick the one that we call the maximum likelihood tree, so the one that fits our evolutionary model the best uh, as the most, as the tree that we're going to use for this gene. But in reality, we typically have a number of different trees that are not significantly different from one another. And so we don't really have any good um, arguments to actually choose this maximum likelihood tree, except that it's the maximum likelihood, but it's not significantly different for, for example, this alternative tree where you would have a switching of two of these genes and the green genes would go here and the blue genes would go here. They would be statistically equivalent. Okay, and because of this, um, of all of these compounded errors in the gene trees, uh, when we look at whole genome duplicated species, we very often misidentify gene copies between species. So we have some genes, for example, this is lemp one. Um, when you look at its location in different species, so the spotted gar is our out group, it's not duplicated. And we have three representative species here, the zebrafish, stickleback, and medaka. They are duplicated, so you have copies of LAMP1 on two different chromosomes in each species. And we can see that the gene tree places the duplication right here and groups these three blue genes and these three green genes. When we look at where those genes are, we do find that the blue genes are found on chromosomes that look very similar, and all these genes that are in blue are annotated as orthologs. So it looks like we are identifying the gene correctly, same for the green one. But when we look at the gene just next to LAMP1, which is G, uh, GRTP1 right here, so the grouping of the tree is again, grouping the blue ones on one side and the green ones on, one, on the other side. But when we look at the location on the chromosomes, we can immediately see that this green zebrafish gene uh, is probably misidentified and the tree is probably incorrect because we would expect, of course, to have the, we would expect this green gene to go into the group with the blues. There's clearly like a misidentification on the tree here. 
And we also have situations like this one right here, a little bit further along the chromosome, where the gene tree by reconciliation with the species tree would place the duplication right here. So would group stickleback and medaka as duplicated species. And so I would probably say that this is a species a lineage specific duplication and not part of the whole genome duplication and have the zebrafish gene right here. But when we look at the location of the genes, it's pretty clear that these genes uh, come from the whole genome duplication and that this yellow gene in zebrafish is actually orthologous to these two blue gene copies and should be in this part of the tree. Okay, so these misidentification of duplicates are fairly common, this misplacement of the duplication in the trees. That makes it very challenging to study how genes explore up to whole genome duplication, because in this case, we would be looking at, well, what do these genes do and what do these genes do? But we're not actually looking at orthologs, the tree is incorrect. And in this case, we would say that this is not a duplicate from the whole genome duplication when it actually is. So fortunately, genomes inherit more than just conserved sequences um, during evolution. And that falls on what I just showed you with the chromosomes. So that's actually a picture coming from primates, but it illustrates the point pretty well. This is a comparison of genomes between uh, human in every case and different related primates. And that is a plot of the order of the genes. And as you can see, uh, closely related species, in this case, human and, and chimpanzee, have almost collinear gene order. And as you move along and go further and further along in evolution, this uh, gene order becomes more and more degraded. And uh, of course, the chromosomes rearrange, so you lose what we call this syntenic order of genes, uh, where genes are inherited in blocks in conserved order. And I'm not going to get into the details of this today. So the question we were asking is, well, can we use this inheritance of genes that are inherited as chromosomes that are inherited in order to try to resolve these gene trees where the sequence information is insufficient to really understand the history of the genes after the duplication? So when you look at it from like a cartoon point of view, you have so your uh, genomic region with the different little genes after, before the whole genome duplication then the whole genome duplication takes place. So this region is duplicated into copies. And then you have this redeploidization process where you have mutations to so the two copies of the genes become more differentiated. Some gene copies get lost and so the two genomic regions become more and more different at the individual gene level, but also at the structural level at which genes are conserved and which are not in terms of gene order. And then when you have the speciation between different species, in this case, for example, in this toy example, this would be zebrafish and medaka. Each of these two fish is going to have these two genomic regions inherited from the ancestor. There can be some more uh, differentiation. For example, medaka has lost this blue gene right here when zebrafish has kept it. But you have so these two copies coming from the ancestor. And the point of what we're trying to do is to say, well, we have these duplicated regions. Can we pair them? Can we find which one is descending from this blue region in each of these two species, which one is coming from these green regions in each of these two species? And basically, when you have these regions, when you know they are duplicated, you, you only have two possible scenarios to pair the regions between the species. The first scenario would be to pair region Z1 with region M1, so this one and this one, and region Z2 with region Z2, this one, this one. And then you can count the similarities both at the sequence level, but also at the organization level. So in this case, we would look at whether we have gene losses in the same locations, retained genes in the same locations, and whether these genes are predicted to be orthologs just based on the sequence information. And when we look at the alternative scenario, so in this case, it would be Z1 paired with M2 and Z2 paired with M1. In this toy example, you can see that while the number of shared retention and losses of genes are much smaller and the number of genes reported by sequence to be orthologs would also be smaller. That's just a toy example, but that illustrates how the methodology that we have developed work. And I'm not going to get into the details of how we benchmark the methodology and so on, but um, suffice to say that this actually works when you look at actual genomes. So we have developed this method that is called Scorpius. Uh, Scorpius is synteny corrected orthologies 
um, Synteny corrected. Sorry, I'm not going to get it. Okay, it's it's a Synteny based uh, method to build ontology graphs between genes and to correct gene trees. And the way the method works is that uh, we will collect genomic regions between different species that we know are duplicated uh, by comparison to a non-duplicated outgroup right here. And we will try to match these regions between species to make sure that we identify correctly these genomes that come from the same ancestral duplicated region. So in this case, we would match the blue with the blue with the blue and the green with the green with the green at the regional scale. In some cases, that means assembling different regions in these genomes because it still may have become rearranged since the ancestral duplication event. So there is a whole uh, part of the process that is to reconstruct what the ancestral regions must have looked like to maximize uh, the pairing between species. And then for each genes in these regions, we're going to use this regional information that basically crowdfunds information on the genome structure and also the gene sequences around each of these genes um, to establish which genes, like all of these genes right here, which are duplicated in two copies in all of these genomes, basically which is which between different species. So in this case, we say, well, these blue, these blue genes and these white genes in zebrafish are all coming from this blue region. So they are probably orthologous and these green genes are probably orthologous between themselves. We use this information to build graphs um, where we do this uh, process recursively between different species to obtain the predicted orthology relationships based on the location in the genome, essentially. And then we resolve this graph to find the orthologous communities. So these genes that we expect are orthologs across different species. And we use this information from this orthology graph um, to build an actual gene tree that is fully resolved, that is consistent with the whole genome duplication event, because that's um, the type of gene tree that we are looking for specifically uh, by looking at these duplicated regions. And that allows us to resolve um, the orthology relationship between these different genes to also find correctly the paralogs and also to explicitly identify any gene losses or genes that may have been poorly identified before uh, because they are, for example, too diverged. And so we are not grouped correctly under the duplication event. All right, and this methodology was published recently. It's the work uh, from my PhD student, Elise Barret, uh, and this was published in Molecular Biology and Evolution earlier this year. OK, so enough on the methodology. Um, let's now discuss how this works in practice. So we applied this methodology to this whole genome duplication event uh, a bit over 300 million years ago. That is foundational to the Telios group, the Telios fish. And we applied the methodologies to gene trees that come from the Ensemble database. So Ensemble is one of the leading databases for comparative genomics. They built gene trees for many, many different species. And the version of Ensemble that we used for, for this work uh, contained 47 teleost fish. Uh, that amounts to about um, 1,500 15, gene trees, sorry. And so we checked how many of these trees were actually consistent with the whole genome duplication event and how many needed correction because the paralogs and the orthologs were not uh, correctly identified. And we found that in this set, about 23% of the genes actually required correction. So as I mentioned earlier, these errors are very pervasive. The gene trees are not reliable when we have whole genome duplications and they really need correction to make sure that we are looking at the correct genes across these different species to investigate how they contribute to phenotypic innovations, for example. We could also show that after corrections, uh, these duplicated analogs showed stronger similarity, which is what we would expect. So we looked at the gene expression of gene copies that become reassigned between species. So in this case, we're looking at the C uh, CXCL, B, um, C, uh, CXCL12 gene. This gene is present in two copies in zebrafish and in medaka, copy A and copy B. And 
In the original gene tree that is available in Ensemble, the copy B of zebrafish is orthologous to the copy B of Medaka. That's how it was named in the first place. And copy A and copy A are also orthologous. And we looked at the expression of this gene across 15 different tissue, um, that's 11 different tissues, uh, including bone, brain, embryo, gills, and so on. And we checked um, the expression of this gene. Scorpius tells us that, in fact, the copy B in zebrafish is orthologous to the copy A in Medaka, and the copy A in zebrafish is orthologous to the copy B in Medaka. And when we check the gene expression, we also find what we would expect, which is that the truly orthologous genes have more similar gene expression, because it's basically the same gene copy in the different genomes. And that's what we find here. We find that this gene copy is mostly expressed in the kidney in both species, while this gene copy is expressed across a variety of tissue and highly in liver as well. So this is just an example on one pair of genes where Scorpius tells us that the assignation in the original gene tree is incorrect and where we can also confirm it with functional information, but we can show that this is the case across the majority of genes um, that we reassign. So how important is it to correct these gene trees when we want to look at how these duplicated gene copies contribute especially to innovations and to phenotypic changes. Well, this is just a small illustration of what happens when you look at um, enriched functional terms using gene ontology or CAG pathways um, across different categories of genes related to the whole genome duplications. So we sorted the genes into three copies, into three, sorry, three categories. The systematic singletons are genes where one of the copies has been lost across all telios. It has been, these genes have been entirely redeployedized and they've all come back to a single copy. Facultative analogs are genes where some species have kept the two copies from the whole genome duplications and some have lost one of them. And systematic analogs are genes where the two copies are kept across all of the, gen of the genomes. All fish have two copies of this gene. And what we see here is that all the terms that are highlighted in bold are terms that you wouldn't find without the correction. So correcting uh, these relationships and cleaning the trees to make sure that the gene that we identify as duplicates or singletons significantly improves the statistical power to investigate the function of these genes as groups. And when we highlight a few genes of interest, uh, you can see that a few terms of interest right here. You can see in red a number of terms that caught our attention because they are all related to function in the heart. And it's known that teleos fish have a number of evolutionary innovations in the heart. So it's very likely that correcting these different gene trees improves the, the um, functional signal across orthologs and improve the signal when you want to look at phenotypic innovations. It's also the case here with melanogenesis, which we wouldn't catch without the tree correction. And that becomes very significant once we correct the trees and make sure we sort the genes correctly. And melanogenesis is very important. It's important for pigmentation. So that's a term that we were quite excited to find here in the genes that are kept in duplicates in some species and not in others, because we expect that genes in these categories will have a lot of adaptations and, and changes related to, to pigmentation. OK, so moving on to what else can we do with this methodology? Uh, something that is of interest to us is to try to understand how the genome changes across evolution and across uh, species. So we know from work from our group and from other groups as well that the ancestor of teleost just before the whole genome duplication had 13 chromosomes. So after the whole genome duplication, it probably had 26 copy A and copy B of each of the chromosomes coming from the duplication. And we were able to use this information using our clean gene trees and our reconstruction of different regions that seems to be orthologous across the different species um, to reconstruct the histories of these ancestral chromosomes across the different genomes of fish. So you have an example here of three different fish, one which is Yarapaima, uh, which is a fairly basal teleost that radiated quickly 
after the whole genome duplication. You have the zebrafish right here, which, uh, which diverge a little bit later on. And then Medaca here, which is right in this group of, of Valentaria. And so you can see where these different ancestral chromosomes have, been called, have become rearranged and how they distribute in terms of gene content and on genomic content across the different chromosomes of these different species. That gives us the possibility to trace how these chromosomes have rearranged, but also which regions are orthologous to each other between different species and to understand how the fish genomes have changed across evolution. And we, we have this information now for, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 75 fish, and this is uh, going to be published hopefully soon. This information can also be used to improve uh, fish gene nomenclature. So at this time, um, the way fish genes are named uh, is through ZFIN. ZFIN is uh, the Zebrafish Information Network. They are the main database for fish genetics and especially zebrafish genetics. They um, name genes, and especially when a gene is kept in two copies from the whole genome duplication, they decide which one is copy A and which one is copy B. And the um, ambition of ZFIN is to make sure that this nomenclature reflects the history of the genome. So technically, the guidelines are that gene A should be next to each other because they come from the same ancestral chromosomes and gene Bs should be next to each other. So when you have a gene that is named with an A, if you're going to name its neighbor gene, the next one on the chromosome, it should also be an A and so on and so on. Unfortunately for, and this nomenclature is then propagated to other fish genomes um, using orthology relationships and gene trees, which as I mentioned earlier, are not perfect. So there's a lot of, of room for errors to become compounded um, when naming these genes. And this is, this is problematic because um, you would expect that gene um, OX, OX12 uh, A something, uh, OX A12 A is the same as OX12, OX A12 A in a different species. But in many cases in fish, it's not the case. So that makes transferring functional annotation and knowledge from other species to zebrafish or to zebrafish from other species is quite challenging. And as you can see here, so this is a representation of the zebrafish chromosomes uh, over here. Uh, they're not in order, but that doesn't really matter. Each of these lines is a chromosome and each of these ticks is a little gene. When they're red, they're annotated as A. When they're blue, they're annotated as B. And as you can see, it's completely jumbled. Um, at this time, copy A and copy Bs are not uh, making a lot of sense in the annotation of the zebrafish when they should because they reflect information from, from the ancestor. So we are currently working with ZFIN uh, to propose a more consistent annotation of zebrafish genes and possibly of other fish, uh, which would not replace um, the current annotation of the zebrafish genes, but would come in addition to make sure that you have a um, source of information that provides information as to which copies are A and which copies are B and make sure that genes that follow each other are either A or B and reflect ancestral chromosome origin. And as you can see here, not only we can obtain like these very nice regions where we can say that they all come from an ancestral chromosome and therefore are all copy A and you would have somewhere in the genome all the copy Bs that correspond to these genes, but also because we use information from the ancestral genome, we can um, also enter the singletons where only one copy has been kept. We can say if copy B or copy B has been kept when, one's on the, when one of the two has been lost. Okay, so I'm just going to try and go very quick on this because we are getting at the end of the time. Um, another question that we can investigate with these tools is how does the whole genome duplication become resolved, and especially during this redeploidization process where genes diverge and become lost and come back in some cases to a deployed state. So the process I've shown you so far is what we call ancestral analog resolution, which is when, well, you have your genomic region with your little genes, they become duplicated during the whole genome duplication, 
And then the two gene copies become more and more diverge because they accumulate mutations, some get lost and so on. And then you have speciation between the two species. And that gives you this very typical tree I've been showing you for the entire presentation, where you have the duplication and the two groups of ortholog genes coming from the duplication. But we know that in some cases, what can happen is that you have the duplication event, and while these two gene copies, these two gene, genome copies, sorry, are still recombining, the speciation can already occur. So you have speciation before these tetravalence in meiosis have been resolved and when the two copies of the genomes are still exchanging material. In this case, the diplodization process occurs after the speciation and is completely independent between the two species. And in this case, which we call linear specific analog resolution or LOR, well, the gene tree that you would obtain based on the sequences look like this. It looks like you've had the duplication in each of these two lineages, just because at this time point, it doesn't look like a duplication. It looks like alleles that are exchanging material. So the tree is incorrect from the point of view of the loci, because the locus did get duplicated someone, somewhere here. But it is correct from the point of view of the sequence information carried at each locus, because it was still recombining at the time uh, the two species diverged. And this is something that has been well documented, especially in Salmonids. Uh, and this is a representation of the chromosomes of the Atlantic salmon. All the regions in dark gray are regions uh, from this whole genome duplication that occurred about 100 million years ago that either still recombine today uh, during meiosis in salmon or have been resolved only recently compared to the radiation of salmons. So we were asking the question, can we identify these delayed diploidization regions uh, using our methodologies? And the idea would be, well, when we correct gene trees with Scorpios to make sure that uh, the whole genome duplication is well placed in the tree, we actually apply a statistical test on the tree to make sure that replacing the duplication at this location where you have different copies coming from the whole genome duplication in your different species um, is actually supported by the sequences, at least as well as another structure. And we can confront this structure proposed by Scorpius to this structure, which is the one we would expect to find if the diplodization is delayed. And in cases where the statistical test tells us that this structure is correct based on the sequence, we can say, okay, well, the Rediploidization process occurred ancestrally. We are in an hour situation. But in cases where lineage duplication, or lineage resolution occurred, you would expect this tree to be more supported by the sequence. And so in this case, the test will tell us, well, maybe you shouldn't correct here. Maybe actually the tree that you get from the sequences is correct. And that is what we expect in these lower situations. So we tested this on the salmons. And it turns out it works really great. Um, all the regions in orange on this representation, which is the salmon karyotype from our um, analysis, all the regions in orange are the one where we predict that the rediploidization was probably linear specific. And when you compare this to what is known in the literature, you have a perfect match uh, between these different regions. So it looks like we can use and kind of hack our own toolkit to identify how these different regions went through rediploidization at, at what time during evolution. So we tried to apply this also to earlier whole genome duplications in fish. So what you would expect to find for this 3R teleos specific whole genome duplication, that the duplication is here. And if you have an ancestral rediploidization right after the whole genome duplication, you expect to find one copy in all of your teleost fish over here and the second copy in all of your teleost fish over here. That is what we find for this gene family, for example. And that is exactly what we would expect to find. That is what Scorpius is designed to do. Now, in some gene families like this one, what we observe is that the, we have significant support to say that this tree is actually better than the one that forces 
the duplication um, at, at this location. And in this case, this one groups these two, Arapaima and Awana, which are basal teleosts together, and then groups all the other fish in this part of the tree, suggesting that you have had a speciation first and then the rodiploidization event occurred here and here. And that is what we would expect in a linear specific rodiploidization pattern. And when we map these, um, these events on the Medaka genome, what appears, and we're still looking into this more, more precisely, but what appears is that you have three different chromosomes that look like they were still, you have six, uh, five, sorry, you have three pairs of <laughs> ancestrally duplicated chromosome, one of which has become uh, fused to become chromosome six in Medaka. And these three pairs seem to still have been recombining at the time that fish started diversifying. We're still looking into this. So to conclude on this analysis, um, we provide a sort of toolkit to study fish genomics and evolution, and especially uh, whole genome duplications. These tools could also be applied to other questions related to whole genome duplications in other groups, um, especially in plants where whole genome duplications are very abundant. Uh, our tool Scorpius is available from GitHub if you have an interest in looking into this. Um, it's a program in Python and it's fairly easy to use. We also maintain a database that some of you have probably used before, which is called Genomicus. Uh, it's a web browser that lets you look at gene order and gene organization across many different species and provides a number of different tools for comparative genomics and ancestral genome reconstruction, comparison of karyotypes, and so on and so on. And I thank you very much for your attention. I'm just going to thank everyone who has worked on this project, uh, especially Elise Paré, uh, my PhD student who has developed Scorpius and has done pretty much all the work I have presented today. Um, and also Hugo Scrollus and Alexandra Louis who are involved in this project and all the members of the Genofish Consortium. Uh, the work I have presented today is part of this international consortium on fish genomics and fish comparative genomics. Uh, that is funded by a French national grant. And I thank you very much for your attention and would be happy to have questions.